Welcome to Rugby AM. I'm Alex Simmons and I'm joined tonight not by JJB, he's missing his MIA, but by the legend that is Leon Price. Pricey, welcome to Rugby AM finally, because you, you've, had, you've had a bit of a pop off at me as soon as you walked through the door today. Uh, I've been quite disgusted with you really, to be, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm God's honest truth. I've sat and watched the show over the years, been really impressed with how it's progressed and what the work you've put into it, but um, I think I think my status within the game, without being beginning, deserved at least to have a, a chance to sit and have a chat with you. Eight years it's been on. I'm eight on, years. Eight years. I've not been on once. Eight years. I've not been on once. We've filmed with you a number of times. We've done all sorts of features. No, 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 no. I want about <laughs> sat on this couch. You're here now. I'm having my name on here. Eight years. We don't, Jimmy, we, it's not right, is it? We don't live in the past. We don't live in the past. No, it's man. not good, Jimmy. You're not, you're, it's, it's you really get to out of sign order. the desk I'm not, I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm not even telling it to you before, have I? But I've, been, <laughs> I've been really out of order. I've been really, really upset about it. I'm, I'm genuinely sorry, mate. And I hope we can make it up to you. We'll get you on every week now. Right, till end, right, end of the series. Right, OK, we're, we're, I'm on now, so it's done. It's done. It, looking back on, obviously, without getting too distracted by not being on Rugby M, when you look back now, obviously, not being in the game, how do you feel about Rugby League? Um, yeah, it's, I, it'd be very hard for me not to to love the game that's given me the opportunities and the lifestyle that I've I've, I've lived over a long period of time. I mean, I've played rugby um, as an amateur since I was eight. Um, signed for Bradford when I think when I was 14, 15, 14, 15. Uh, made my debut at Bradford when I was sixteen, and then from there till I was thirty-five, I've had, you know, I've, I've been getting paid money to to play a game that I absolutely adore and love. So it'd be hard for me not to love the game. The only difficult part is when you finish. Um, when you when you play, you're obviously your, your talent or your skills and whatever you've got as physically or whatever you produce speaks for itself. But then, when that's gone, um, you can be very quickly forgotten. And there's, there's much better players than me that have been very you know forgotten from the game very very quickly. So I think that's the that's the hard part is the, is the next step. And um, if you want to stay involved, then you've got to really work it. Yeah. Does the game do enough? For players in transition, I don't think we've got enough of the uh, enough players involved within the game. But a lot of that's got to do with the profile of the game. Obviously, football you've you know you've got a million TV stations. It's a multi-billion-pound business. Um, rugby league's not. It's not. You know, it's not. It's a northern sport in the country, um, and we lose we lose a lot of people out of the game. You know, the, you, you're quickly forgotten. So uh, no, I don't believe we do enough. No, I've got a question. Um, I've always been a big passionate fan of rugby league. I love, I've loved this journey with rugby. And it's been one of the best achievements in my life to be able to showcase so many great personalities. And I look back <clears throat> to when I'm DJing in clubs, and I used to go down Headley on a Friday night with my mates, have a few beers, and watch a game. And a lot of my friends were playing at the time. Lads who I played amateur were playing for the Rhinos at the time. And, and it was genuinely so tough, so entertaining. Do you think the game now is a worse spectacle? Is the game in 2020 in a worse place than it was, say, in 2010 or 2000? Right, OK, so for me, if I sit here and tell you it's worse, then I'm just going to sound like an old, old has-been that sounds bitter and twisted. I'll ask you, what do you think? Great question. Go on, you answer the question. What th do you think? I think it's lost its gladiatorial edge. I think that... We're in real danger of rugby league losing its identity. I think that as a sport, if you look at UFC, so I, I always think of the market, and I, that's what I do for a day job. I think with rugby league, we don't sell the game well enough yep. to the wider audience. We don't know what we are as a sport. We don't know whether we're parochial, Northern M62, and we're proud of our heritage, or whether we're going to be expansionists and go to Toronto, go to Dublin, go to the south of France, go further afield. Yep. Until the game has an, a plan... Identity. And, no, it's not an identity. Until you, the think, you think it's got an identity? Though? I think it's got an identity crisis. OK. It's got an identity, but what I'm saying is, until the game has a plan on uh, expansion and, and says, this is our direction, this is what we're going to do, and this is our identity, and this is how we're going to promote, market, sell the game, and here's our target partner list of companies, and we're a northern powerhouse, so we're going to go to northern-based companies, or yeah. we're a global sport. Or, you know, my, my 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 thoughts on it is this: is back when I first started and before my day. So when I were coming through, big players: Gary Schofield, Jason Robinson, Martin Fire, Ellery Anley, just to name a few. They were they were actual 
they were actually well known. They were they were they were they were you know iconic um, household names. Yeah, household names. Yeah, within his country. Uh, so and after that, you look at Andy Farrell, uh, Paul Scunthorpe, Kieran Cunningham, Sean Long, um, Robbie Paul, Kev Sinfield. Kev Sinfield. So over the generation, over the years, Jim Peacock, Sam Burgess, Sam Burgess. We we have always we've always had a little bit of a profile, even though we're only a northern a northern sport within within Great Britain. We've always had we've had two, we've had stars, but for me, other than Sam Tompkins, or Sam Tompkins, I, I don't think we've really have got many. We've not got a profile. I think we've got we pride ourselves on being a really humble sport. But for me, you've got to have superstars. You've got to have people you love, people you hate. Um, you know, we, people hate Sean Long. But he were a good player, and you wanted to see, you wanted to watch him. People don't like me, but you probably, you people didn't like me, but you want to watch to see what happened, because you had a little bit of a profile. <clears throat> For me now, the game has got no real genuine stars. Um, and if you were an eight, nine year old, and somebody said to you, right, um, Leon, at nine year old, do you want to come through and play a sport that eventually, if you're good at it, you can get one hundred and fifty thousand pound a week? And, and you know, by the time you're 32, you can retire and never work again. Or you can play rugby league, and you can do okay. And you're going to have to, you're going to probably retire a broken person with broken body, and have to just carry on working. For me, the the the, the it's not moved. The game is not this game's money and salary and uh, wages. Even though I don't like to talk about it for money, people don't like talking about it. People, you know, on social media will always go. I'd play for free. Why are you talking about money? But it's got to move with the times. You know, the people that when when people retire, people can't walk. You know, I, I find it hard to walk upstairs, and I played on on the wing. Uh, Nick Fozard, his shoulders don't work. Um, and you go through anybody, any anybody of the players who's played ten to fifteen years of Super League, a high a decent, you know, a decent level. Most people, most people's health's done by the time they finish, and I, I just think. The wages back in probably 1990 were higher than what they are in 2020. That's not that's not moving forward. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great point. It's an absolutely fantastic point. I still think there is some positives, and one positive recently that you hate is that Leeds won't challenge Cook. <laughs> it's, I don't mean it, yeah. <laughs> I've never said this on camera, have I? <laughs> You're not the biggest fan of Leeds. No, no, no. I, no. I think I was worse when I was younger, but I, I think this is the difference when you know you say that rivalry. Yeah. When I played, like there were there was Bradford and then there were Leeds, so there were Chev, Bailey, um, Mathers, uh, Mathers, all the golden generation, Rob yeah. Burrow, Maguire, all of them guys. They were they were all the Leeds boys, yeah. and there were us. We didn't like each other. Yeah. It was genuine hatred. <laughs> but when you got on the field, that's what fans want to see. Yeah. Fans want to see you like give. Was not, it preparing for a Leeds game back then as a Bradford player, as a young Bradford player? What give me a bit of an insight into the kind of chat and the kind of feeling in camp, preparing for I it. Can't really speak. There were twenty thousand people turning up to Odsall yeah, for well, that. Yeah, well, I'll just. So I, I get nervous before games, but I remember that my, this is my biggest one. Was we played um, Leeds in the Challenge Cup final, two thousand and three, Millennium Stadium. And I remember being in change rooms in, before the game and I was the only Bradford-born player within the Bulls team. And I was thinking, we cannot lose to these in a Challenge Cup <laughs> final. Like, it means too much. Like, I, what will I, I do it. if I lose? If I lose to these in a Challenge Cup, in a Challenge Cup final, what's going to happen the rest of my life? And I've been sick in the, I've been sick in the bath before the game. I've never sick before a game. And I, it, was just a, it was just a thought of what, what will happen if I lose to these. But I'll tell you, when you retire, that, feeling that you that animosity you have towards the other it completely goes like yeah i've got a lot of respect for the way that leeds run the club as a business and, and and for the success they've had over the years and that kind of edginess that you had with you know with players over the years it completely goes and it turns into complete you know, respect because you've been there you've done it you've fought against each other and you know you've got out of the other side so <clears throat> when i have a bit of a giggle with you about it yeah and i have a I play up to it a little bit that animosity that you have when you're playing for me is completely gone. Yeah. And for me now, it's I want to see the boys do well. I want to see Danny Mags do well at Ulkar. I want to see, I want to see JP do well in his career. I want to see Bailey have a good life because it's a tough game, and I want to see the boys do well after. One player who was like a, a young star, a local lad who, who who cut his teeth over at Bradford is Paul Cook. 
Do you remember Cookie? Was he a bit older? Tell us a bit about Cookie. So when Paul Cook came on stage, I think it was 1995 or 1996, and I was just a ball boy. I were a, I were a fan at Bradford, and he was just he were killing it. He was doing really really well at Leeds, and somehow we signed him. I think he played for Great Britain. There were a lot. He had a lot of um, press around him at the time. I remember. Um, yeah, and we signed him, and he, did, he was fantastic. Yeah, he was re- he was a really big name back in yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. When he signed for Bradford, he was doing very very well. Yeah, so yeah, I've got not but. Not but respect for Cookie, yeah, I thought he were a good signing, a really good signing for Bradford. Well, he's going to take us right now down memory lane, so check this out. Hi, I'm Paul Cook, and this is my memory lane. Not the easiest of kicks for a 19-year-old, but again, not a breath of wind down there. Ideal for kicking a goal oh and just look at that one it goes through the post the flags are raised and Bradford are back in this game with a vengeance so the, the Challenge Cup final in 1996 was um, a big event for me obviously the semi-final beating my former club um, I was more nervous for the semi only just leaving Leeds eight week um, before that um, so yeah the Challenge Cup final was, was a massive thing getting through the semi beating Leeds and Obviously, getting to Wembley to, to play centre lens. Cook, oh, superb dummy by Paul Cook. He's looking for support on the inside. Well, does he need it? So, yeah, when we got down to London, obviously, I was rooming with Matt Calland. Obviously, I was playing on the wing that game, and so he was just like me, just crazy and just giddy. So, uh, yeah, it was a good roommate to have. And the nerves really did kick in as you pulled into the stadium, into the old Wembley. Um, Wembley Way, where the, the bus went went into the to the big doors were opened, and the fans were just banging on the or both sets of fans were just banging on the bus. It was absolutely crazy, and you could see people you knew and that coming into the tunnel. I think it was in the tunnel for about 10, 12 minutes after the after the song of the song of Abide with Me. So that's when he started walking out. But that was massive. You couldn't really see much of the stadium, just probably the top of the stadium, at the other side where the Bradford fans was. But that was that was a long way, and that's when the the, the nerves and the, the things really did kick in. That walk there to to line up for the national anthems and to meet the meet the people you was to meet was, was seemed like forever. The game went quicker than, than that did. Going into the game, um, Saints was obviously the favourites, um, but within within first ten minutes of the game, Saints went into an eight 0 lead. Um, Steve Prescott scored a couple of tries, and yeah, it looked like we were still on the bus, or we were still looking for families in the crowd because we was eight 0 down at that time, and yeah, it was a it was a bit, bit of a bit of a struggle at start. So after that bad start, um, we seemed to get back to, back onto it pretty quickly. John Scales and Robbie Paul scored tries, and I kicked three goals. And um, within within the matter, it was like a game of two halves. Within the matter of of minutes, we was 14-12 up, and that's the scoreline we took into the halftime break. Paul Cook then looking to keep his 100% record, and he does again. The accuracy is there. The ball is over the crossbar. Cook nonchalantly strolls back, but he knows that Bradford Bulls are in the lead for the first time in this match, 14 points to 12. So yeah, half time was was pretty was pretty good. Obviously, Brian Smith, one of the best coaches I've I've played under, um, one of the you know really really thorough. He just calmed us all down, kept us all calm, um, told us what we need to do in the second half, um, and basically the, the little things we needed to do, what we'd done right in the first half. So the half-time team, team talk must have worked because Bernard Dwyer scored and then Robbie Paul scored again and, and, and I'd kicked a few more goals for, for five from five. So it looked like it was all, I think it was 26-12 we was, was winning, so it looked like we was, was on our way to a great victory. And two tries from him already. Paul Cook, 10 metres in from the touchline, right-footed. Oh, he lofts it high and nothing's going wrong for, uh, for Paul Cook. The fists are raised in the air. So from being 26-12 up and, and going in, everything's rosy. Um, and then all of a sudden, the final, what the final will be remembered for is the, the three kicks up in the air uh, within minutes from Bobby Goulding and obviously going in from that to, to, to being down um, 12 to 14 points. On the fifth tackle, Goulding again with the same treatment for Nathan Claymore. It's over that line again. The ball's loose. So on the back of that, uh, back of coming off them three bombs, Robbie Paul went and scored his hat trick try, um, which was 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 great. 
and obviously got us to within two points and, and belief again. But then, uh, unfortunately, Apollo Perellini crashed over, and that was um, that was the result. You've always dreamed of, of touching that trophy and picking that trophy up, but to, to walk up there, um, up them famous steps to pick the losers' medal up was was disheartening and, and disappointing. But some I remember uh, the day and the occasion can still remember it to this day. The week leading into the, fi the final, obviously, was a, there was an incentive for anybody scored an hat trick. Um, was to get £10,000, so we agreed as a club that if anybody was to score the hat trick, then we'd put, they'd have half to themselves and half to the, to the, to the team, and obviously that went to the end of season trip to Tenerife. So fair play to Robbie, he stood by that and, and kept, kept 5,000 for himself and 5,000 into the, into the players' fund to Tenerife, which was, was, was pretty good. So I did get another crack the, the year after, the same two teams got there. This time we was favourites because we was undefeated in the Super League, but unfortunately Saints um, won that game e pretty much easily um, that day and, and, and rightfully so, they were the best team on the day. But to play at Wembley in, in two Challenge Cup finals was always a dream in front of 7,000, 8,000 people was, was, was a magic and a dream come true. I'm Paul Cook and that was my memory lane. Paul Cook's memory lane there. Pricey, you were there at that game. Yeah. Devastated, yeah, absolutely devastated. I think that was the um, that was the day that my hero, one of my heroes in my life, Robbie Paul, made his name for himself and scored a hat trick at Wembley. Um so that was a good memory even though we lost. Um yeah, it's, it's fun memories, you know, you when you're a 14, 14 year old kid watching your hometown team in a, a Challenge Cup final, it's brilliant. Great Adrian Molly story as well, but we'll, we'll ask most to tell that one day on the show. Absolutely superb. Um, I wanted to ask you about post playing because you went to work at Workington and you did a great job there, up there, and you love the Cumbrian people. But uh, we went up there, filmed it in yeah. the sheds, with you, but you yeah. did a great job up there and it, it didn't work out. You had a disagreement maybe with somebody on the board. And if you want to go into that, it's, it's, it's up to you. But and I know there's no animosity there, but. After doing a great job, to then not get another opportunity in the sport, that must be tough. Yeah, um, I had a great time there. There were um, a lot of people that helped me very, very much. So um, John Walker, who was one of the directors, was brilliant with me. Absolutely fantastic, helped me from day one. Um, Ellen McDowell, um, who I've known since I was like 15, who was fantastic with me, really helped me. There were a lot of people around the area that were absolutely brilliant and they couldn't do enough for you. They put you up in their houses, make you make tea, support you, but you know there's there's there's, there's things that go on in the background that you know you don't want to go into detail um, that that could be hard work, but overall the whole, the whole experience was fantastic. I had a great time, and it is where it is. Before we move on, just tell us a bit about Cumbria. I've been to Cumbria. I've had the pleasure of going to Cumbria. Cumbria. For me, I love going to Off Pro on it. I love going to Egremont when we did the NCL stuff. That were of all the stuff I've done on Rubem, doing that year on the NCL, showing those games were probably my favourite thing. That and going to World Cup, yeah. unbelievable, and total different levels. Right. Going to World Cup and going to NCL games, favourite experiences in Rubem. So I'll go. I'll, I'll, I'll probably go. I'll touch on two subjects. So yeah. I know a lot of people. Are, over the over, you know, because me and you have talked a lot of it yeah. about lately about the race stuff and people. You know, at the moment it's quite a big subject and people yeah. talk about it more. People always ask me, Were you, "Did you find a lot of races in Cumbria?" Leon, because there's obviously not many mixed race black people, um, yeah. different eth ethnic, uh, you know, minorities up there. But Cumbria is a place where there's not many ethnic minorities, but the people couldn't be any friendlier. Yeah. You know what it's like when you go somewhere; it's a little bit hostile. Yeah, people, yeah, give you, yeah. people give you that second look. And you feel a little bit uncomfortable. You know it. Yeah. I know it. You don't talk about it much, but we know it happens. Yeah. Cumbria couldn't be any opposite. It yeah. be any, it's yeah. like it's like people see you and they're so friendly. Everybody goes out of the way to help you. They'll take you. They'll bring you. Leon, if you've got anywhere to stay, stay at my house if you want tonight. Come Proper out of my house nice people, man. Really, really good people. Really, really good people. Fantastic. And the second bit is rugby league is number one up there. It's God. You know they talk about the ex-players like God. Yeah, you know, I, um, when I went to work, we talk about Desi Drummond and Gus Risman <laughs> and all the players that we've had there that that have been amazing players for him over the years, and they still speak up like like it yesterday. That's how much I remember him, and 
you know, it's there's not as it's not a city life, it's country life, so it's not going there's not much going on like there is in Bradford and Leeds yeah. and Manchester, what have you. So rugby's rugby's their thing. Yeah. Rugby is, a, is what they do on a Sunday. It's a yeah. big day out, um, but some very very good people. They're very very good. That um, you know, I couldn't speak out enough of the place. So knowing what you know about Cumbria, and I'm going to flip this into like a two pronged question: Should Super League go back to licensing, and should there be a franchise in Cumbria? Do you think, from your experience at working in? The Cumbrians need to pull together and get a Cumbrian side. I know it might mean the traditional end of working in Whitehaven, Barrow, whatever, but do you think that a one centralised team in Cumbria will do more for that area? So, or, and also, do you think like, licensing, franchising should come back into Super League rather than... Right, so I, so real, I completely yeah. agree with you. I think what you're saying is right. So when I went, when I went to Cumbria, to, when I went to Workington to coach... Yeah. I have that same mentality as what you're, excuse me, what you're saying. But then you have the reality. So what I was saying to you before is, if you play Super League and you're a, a good, an OK player, a good player, yeah. on average you can earn around, <clears throat> let's say, 35, 40 grand a year. Yeah. I don't know, roughly? Mm, maybe roughly, a little bit more. Maybe 45, a little bit more. 50. 45, 50. Yeah. 45, average 50. Super League player. Average Super League player, yeah. 45, 50. Then people that work up there, a lot of them work at Sellafields, yeah. which is a massive company. A lot of them guys are already earning around about that yeah. money, if not more. Yeah. So for them to lose a job that they can have for 30 or 40 years, yeah. to play for, to do a job that they can have for f- five years, years max. six years, yeah. they, don't, <clears throat> they don't care. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not overly <clears throat> fussed about playing full-time rugby. Yeah, They've yeah. got a couple in Super League, that's it. Is that why they're so good, amateur teams are so good up there? Yeah, because they all stay amateur. They've got, they've got careers, they've got, they've got a pathway of a, st- a stable, Income. I couldn't believe how, how good some of Wathbrow players were. When I went to watch Wathbrow on it, the it's, first it's team. It's like a professional setup. Great, great players like, like people up there. We, Kyle Dixon, centre. Unbelievable we trying, player. We were trying to sign players when we're in my second season at um, <coughs> Workington, excuse me, and they wouldn't leave because they wanted to do a Great Britain Barla tour. Now, <laughs> down here, nobody even talks about Barla. Yeah. If somebody said to you, you want to go play for a Keithley, or you want to, you, yeah, of course we'll play for him, but. They won't sign for you because they wanted to go and do the baller. Yeah, yeah. But they can do that because it's you know they, they hold it up here because they, it's good for them to stay amateur. The amateur setups as good as nearly as good as a semi-professional. Yeah. Um, what, what's your thoughts on on the promotion relegation Super League situation? Obviously, would you like to see you return to licensing? How, how do you see that work? I don't. I don't know, Simo. I don't know. Um, I think it's six or one half a dozen the other. I think. Um, I love the excitement of relegation. Yeah. But I also enjoy a, a, a club um, having the opportunity to build over and not have the pressure of being relegated. I like um, you know, like Catalans over over the years have been a real massive bonus for the, for Super League, haven't they? Yeah. I think they were exempt from going down down for five six years, were they? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. To give them time to build. I'd, I'd, You've been there. Yeah. How good is it, Catalan? It's the best best experience of my life. Is it better than any th- any other club? No, I love Saints and Bradford, my best clubs, but... Um, the experience. The experience. You, living in south of France, I had a beach. A bit, the beach was 500 metres away from me. I had a golf course in my back garden. I, uh, I had a golf course 200 metres away from me. I had a swimming pool in my back garden. We had, you have sunshine two, 250 days a year. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. You get paid decent money. It's amazing. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. Bernard Gosh is a good man. Really looked after me. Really good with my family. My children, both my children were very, very young. They both learned to speak French. My, my son still speaks fluent French now. Got got an A in his exams in French. I went to watch Will play for England against France, and he's stood there talking to all French boys fluent French. I thought, how amazing is that? It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it's amazing. Like if you, I... you do nothing, <laughs> <laughs> you can't speak good. Oh, I can order food. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, like if like I always say to people, how oh, did you do in France? You know, did you, did you know, did you do this? Did you do that? I said, listen, my son can speak fluent French. How you know, that's the best I could give my yeah. ch- child in life. I don't need to, you know, I don't need to take in anything else in a way. I'm not bothered that I didn't win any trophies. My experience was great, but my, my son can speak fluent French. It's amazing. That's a great achievement. We'll see you right here for more Rugby on Free Sports in part two. Keep locked.